When I was in fourth grade, I had a teacher named Miss Maroney. And Miss Maroney used to dye her hair purple every day. And she had these great purple stockings. And she would roll them up her leg until it got to her knees, and then she would stop. So she always came on with her purple hair and her purple stockings. And she had these wonderful hats that us fourth grade kids just loved, you know. So I miss Maroney now. <laughs> Class, today we're going to talk about human evolution. And I want to ask you, think back into the great prehistory of our ancestors and think, what was it? that gave us the cutting edge that led to this great ascendancy that we have today. So Billy raised his hand and he said, Miss Maroney, Miss Maroney, I think I have the answer. Maybe it was our big brains that you know, gave us this thinking edge that, that led to all these wondrous things that has happened to us. Oh, Billy, that was a good guess. But you know, guesses will get you just so far in life. And then you're going to need the right answer. So then Mary raised her hand. She said, Miss Maroney, Miss Maroney, I think I have the answer. Maybe it was our upright stance, you know, that got us to walking down out of the trees and walking with confidence across the savanna. And maybe that's what gave us the cutting edge. Oh, Mary, good looks will get you just so far in life. And then you're going to need the right answers. So then Miss Maroney gave us the answer. You see, according to her explanation, we have these marvelous dexterous hands with four digits and a counter-opposing thumb. And with those digits, we could hold tools. We could carry weapons. We could wage war. And that's what gave us the cutting edge. What a terrible thing to tell children. Oh my gosh. Well, I've been thinking about this for the last 60 years. <laughs> I'm John Turk now. And I have something that I have to tell you today. OK. Let's go back approximately three million years ago, about when our pre-human ancestors had the first simple stone tools. OK? So now, for the last three million years, about 99 or 99.9, .9, depending on where you, you have the transition between simple tools and complex tools, is it the bow and arrow, or the rocket ship, or the AK-47? It doesn't matter. You see, 99 point a lot of our time on this planet, we had very, very, very simple tools. And a tiny sliver of time, we live in a more technological era. But. During these three million years that our stone tools were very simple, we were growing a big, increasingly large brain. Now, a brain is a very expensive metabolic organ. You have to find more food to feed the brain. So. The brain has to give you some evolutionary advantage other than high technology. 
This is all anthropological fact. This is irrefutable. So the question is, what were we doing with our big brains for three million years? OK, now just to make sure that we're all on the same page here, I'm going to get my stone axe again. This is a real meal deal. This is a Solomon Island stone axe. I want everybody in this room to imagine going out into a tropical hardwood forest with this, finding a tree two meters in diameter, chopping it down, shaping <laughs> a dugout canoe with this axe. Now we've changed scales here because there are no of the ancient canoes left to work with. And paddling this canoe thousands of miles across trackless ocean with no navigational equipment. Now nobody in this room, nobody in this world could do that today. We live in the Anthropocene. We live in a world where, where we all are dependent on our technology. We all own cars and computers, and some of us own shaped skis, and we live in a wor world of glorious opulence. It's wondrous. Nobody would want to go back to what Colleen was saying at a time when people died when they were in their 40s. But what we want to talk about, we have this terra incognito between aboriginal wisdoms Nobody's going to go back to the Stone Age. And technology, which is wonderful, but the problem, you see, with our technology is that in addition to the opulence, it has created a great deal of trouble for us. And we have to find our way through this trouble. And my argument is that we don't have to invent something new. We have to rediscover something very old, which is what we were doing with our brain for three million years. OK, I'm an adventurer. This has nothing to do with the fact that I'm also a writer and a public speaker. It's just what I do. I'm an adventurer. So in 1999 and 2000, I decided to paddle a kayak across the Pacific Ocean from Japan to Alaska up along the North Pacific Rim. So we had some days that were really beautiful, calm, and, and we had storms and ice and all kinds of trouble, you know, North Bering Sea. OK, so one day we're paddling along, and there was a village. And we thought, well, let's stop in the village, but no, we've got a long ways to go. We're going to paddle past the village. And all of a sudden, with no indicator on my barometer watch, no, no indication of no lenticular clouds in the sky, the rain started to fall, and the wind started to blow. So we decided to go to town after all, OK? So we jumped through the surf, came through the surf, and got up on the beach, and this woman walked up on the beach, came up to talk to us. She was speaking in English. She said, John. And she looked at my Russian friend, Misha. It's good to see you. We were expecting you. The grandmother created this storm to bring you to our village. She wants to talk to you. Well, you know, dum, 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 dum. <laughs> what was I thinking? I was thinking, there's a storm out there. There's a warm house over there. I can smell their baking bread. I said, sure, we'd love to talk to the grandmother. And the next day, we went up river to talk to the grandmother, Moulinot. She was 96 at the time. She was born during the reign of Tsar Nicholas II. One thing led to another, and Misha and I spent a, a lot of time over the next five years 
in this village and in the tundra surrounding the village. And I'm going to summarize what we learned in these five years that our power, human power, your power, my power, comes not from one place, but from three separate places. The foundation of it all is the tundra, the energy rising up out of the earth, the ability of the great expanse of cold blizzards to clean your mind from all the garbage and junk and chaos that your think-too-much-know-it-all brain sometimes generates up for itself. That's the base. And then there's the hunter in the Koryak tradition. The hunter, of course, is the man. But in North America, the hunter can be a man or a woman. It doesn't matter. The hunter has a relationship, a physical relationship with the landscape, a relationship with his or her body. You move in a physical way through this landscape, through this life. The hunter is the pragmatist, the tool user, the person who brings home the meat for the people in the village. And then there's the shaman. And the shaman includes, but is not exclusive, of the woman with the drum or the man in the eagle headdress. The shaman is also the dancer, the artist, the person who brings ecstasy to the village. Well, so I spent five years in Siberia here, and then I thought, you know, if I've really learned my lesson, I should put my own physical body to the test. So I attempted this circumnavigation of Ellesmere Island, which was a very difficult expedition in a polar situation. So, you know, we, we started out in early May when it was cold and went through the cold and the good weather and the rough ice and walked for weeks through the meltwater slush. Our feet were rotting out, our boots were rotting out over pressure ridges and into this situation where in, in early July the ice was starting to break up. And we have this constriction here. We were right here on the northeast edge of the island where this huge polar ice pack is grinding through this constriction between Ellesmere Island and Greenland. And it breaks the ice into little pieces. You can't walk over it and you can't paddle through it. And it's a very, very dangerous situation where you're, you're right on the edge of getting munched all the time. So you're jumping from flow to flow, moving, moving ice. And if you fall through a crack and the ice closes in on you, it's going to squish you until your eyeballs pop out. So you've got to have a mental attitude. You've got to find a way to get through this ice. Let me think for a second. Right, right. Do, does everybody remember this? When the going gets tough, the tough gets going. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my entire life. I'm going to get tougher than the North Pole ice pack. Right. That's the mentality that when we have a problem, we buy a bulldozer. And if we have a bigger problem, we buy a bigger bulldozer. You see, that's what's getting into this problem, this mess of overuse of our technology. How about this? When the going gets tough, <laughs> the tough drink tea. Whoa! Doesn't that kind of sit better in the pit of your stomach? Doesn't that make you feel more relaxed? So we waited. And then eventually, the ice moved out. We made our way through the gauntlet and into the calm waters, which allowed us to complete our circumnavigation. Let me summarize here what I'm trying to say. I'm going to pull up a quote by Einstein 
the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. So you see, we have this three million years where we had, you know, we had our own problems, different kinds of problems, of course, but then we have this a very small amount of time where we have new problems, and to solve the new problems, we need new solutions. If you lose the magic in your life, you lose your power. That's what Marina said. It does, she didn't say if you lose the keys to your bulldozer, you lose your power. Our power comes from the dancer, from the musician, from the artist, from compassion from love. That's what got us through the Stone Age, and that's what's going to carry us into the future with any semblance of hope and sustainability. Thank you.